it's good to be here. It's good to see everyone out, and we will have a good service as we always do. We are appreciative of every effort to serve the Lord. This morning, we're going to spend some time talking about <coughs> perilous times. Morality in the United States has been declining for many years. Evil is rampant. There are more atheists in the United States than there ever has been before. God is openly rejected in our public schools and in many government areas. You can't even walk in public without hearing a curse word or God's name used in vain. But you know what? The Bible foretold of these times. From our scripture reading, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 <clears throat> it reads, but know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. Folks, we are in the last days. And we're going to look at all the passages that deal with this very concept. You see, the coming of perilous times really is not a manifestation of terrible natural disasters, such as earthquakes or hurricanes or tornadoes or avalanches, tidal waves. In fact, perilous times are not a reference to wars or crimes either. Perilous times is when man has turned his back on God. It is a time when man serves himself rather than serving God. It is a time of spiritual depravity, as outlined. In fact, the word perilous means hard to bear with, to deal with, painful, harsh, grievous, or troublesome. The situations are so bleak that no one will want to experience them. The only other time this Greek word actually is being translated in the New Testament is in Matthew chapter 28, <clears throat> excuse me, in Matthew chapter 8, verse 28, where it's translated exceedingly fierce. Exceedingly fierce times is what he's describing here, will come. Times, according to another dictionary I have, times will become so difficult and dangerous that people will simply hide, hoping things will get better on their own since they are powerless to change the situations themselves. Those are the perilous times that Paul is referencing to Timothy in this particular letter. Now, notice the description that depicts these times. And that's what he continues to write about in verses 2 through 5. He says, men will be lovers of themselves. Lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, despiser of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying his power, and from such people turn away, is Paul's advice. Now notice the, the, the list does not include what we normally would see in scriptures or normally refer to or think of something that would be equated to perilous times. <laughs> we would think perilous times, it must be a lot of murders going on. It must be a lot of adultery going on. It must be a lot of really wicked things going on. And, and not that they aren't, they are. But the things that are listed in this list are things that we oftentimes don't take seriously. We, we take oftentimes for granted, you know, money, people love our money. Oh, that's Pretty common, right? People greedy all the time. Yeah, that's, well, that makes for perilous times. We find people that are boasting and proud. Is, that makes for perilous times. Do you see the point? And when you go through all this list, it's not big things. Well, at least not big things as we see it in our lives. Not major sins, if we, the way we look at things. We're talking about things which... <clears throat> seem to us rather every day people being unthankful people being unloving people being unforgiving slandering one another I mean we see this almost on every day folks these are perilous times is what Paul is mentioning to us and helping us to understand these are descriptive of today in fact that's what he says in the first one these perilous times will come in the last days. And that's what we're in. And that's what we see. We see so much perilous activity in our lives, we take it for granted as though it's not perilous at all. 
But yet, it will affect us in a tremendous way and could prevent us from us entering heaven. But even more shocking is the fact that these people have a form of godliness. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? The perilous times, the things that we often take for granted because we see it all the time, are coming from people who claim to be religious themselves. They have a form of godliness. However, they resist the truth and deny its power. These people are described as having corrupt minds. They're evil men. They're imposters who do what? They deceive and are deceived. Let's go to verse 13, same chapter. But evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. <clears throat> These are the kind of people that describe the perilous times in which we're in. Cause it, perhaps, if we want to call it. Say it that way. People who pretend to be godly, pretend to be religious, but really are quite deceptive and they deceive and they're being deceived themselves and it becomes all part of the, the norm. And on top of that, he says it only gets worse. We know that in our society. It doesn't seem like there's any let up. It doesn't seem like there's ever any less immorality in our, our life. Let's talk a little more about this perilous time, backing up the first Timothy now, chapter 4. Let's go to verses 1 through 3. Now, the Spirit expressly says, in the latter times, as again, the times in which we live, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, Forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. <clears throat> if things weren't bad enough, in these times, he says, some will depart from the faith preferring to believe those who deceive. Some will depart from the faith, from the truth, from God's word, preferring to believe people who are telling lies. They teach their own doctrines, which are described as doctrines of demons. They teach their own rhetoric. They teach their own ideas. Not scriptural ideas, but ideas that they come up with themselves, or a group of people come up with themselves, or somebody comes up with this idea and it just kind of festers and it catches on to other <coughs> churches or other ideas. And the next thing you know, people are believing these instead of believing what the truth is he has to say. It says they are hypocrites and liars who have their own conscience seared. Meaning it doesn't bother them. They have their own conscience so seared by the lies and the deceptions that they are telling that they don't even realize it themselves. They are numb to it. They have been seared in their conscience. Now let me ask you a question. What religion do you know that forbids marriage for certain people and certain foods at certain times? <laughs> Could it be that the Lord's talking specifically to such? Well, actually, I certainly would say that it's inclusive. But I think there's more than just one religion that's doing this. In fact, I would suggest that most every religion is doing this. Most every religion that has... A denominational name is doing this in one way or another. These are the kind of people that the Lord is warning us about. The perilous times that they cultivate. The perilous times that they are attributing to. We call that apostasy. When you leave God's word and you follow something other than what the Lord has prescribed, that's apostasy. Well, Let's talk about that a little bit. Let's back up now all the way to 2 Thessalonians. This time chapter 2. Let's read verses 3 through 4 and then 9 through 12. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or is that, or that is worshipped. So that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Strange, isn't it? Verse 9. 
the coming of the lawless one, which we were just referring to, is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Now listen to this. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, and that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. This is a scary passage because it points out right off the bat that a great falling away is going to occur, that people are going to leave the Bible truth, that people are no longer going to adhere to it, but remember, they have a form of godliness. They're not going to follow God's word, but they're going to pretend to be God's servants. The Lord categorizes it as those who exalt themselves to the position of God. Now, do you know any religious group that has as its head a man who claims infallibility? Think about what the Lord is saying here. For that matter, how many religious groups got started by men creating their own rules to follow as though they were given the right to do so by God? Don't we call that denominationalism? Where people have created their own rules? Oh, they'll tell you they're following the Bible, but if you read the Bible, you find out they're not. But they'll tell you that these rules are all in conjuncture and all in agreement with God's word, and it's actually not. And yet, the verses we've already read said that they would be liars, deceiving and being deceived. Folks, Paul's dead on. This is the time in which we live. The perilous times in which we live is what he describes. And a key element to their operation is deception. <clears throat> the lack of love for the truth, so they practice lawless deeds. They say one thing, they do another. They say that they follow God's word, but then they turn around and do unspeakable sinful things. And on recent <laughs> memory, they even support those within their religious organizations as though it was somehow or other okay. <laughs> so actually try to hide it from the public view. As though what they were doing as a group or as an organization, as a religion, was somehow or other okay, but they just went a little too far. After all, everybody sins. Folks, despicable. Terrible that people would even think in such a manner. It says they lack the love for the truth. And because of that lack of love, because they're not willing to abide by God's word, they're will, not willing to open the scriptures and say, yes, I can and can't do this. Based upon God's word, they will do the opposite. They'll practice lawless deeds. Because they love unrighteousness, God says he'll, they'll, he, being God, will send them strong delusions that they may continue to believe the lies and find condemnation as a reward. And that sounds to me like God working against you. God working against false religions. God working against denominations. God working against anybody who's going to practice religion when they're not following God's word. He says he'll do that on purpose. He'll let them believe their own lies. He'll let them believe the delusion that they have perpetrated upon everybody else. For the purpose of making sure that they don't make it to heaven. Wow. Another point that needs to be made is this apostasy that comes in these last days that we're talking about. Often developed from false teachers from within. Going over to Second Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2, I'd like to read verses 1 through 3. <clears throat> but there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false prophets among you. Now, let me just pause here a moment and let's think about this for a minute. It isn't that there's just going to be false teachers amongst the worldly religions that we already have defined, that they're going to purposely be lying purposely deceiving, 
He says, not only the, among them, among the people, but even among you, meaning among the members of the Lord's church. Who will secretly do what? Bring in destructive heresies. That's, again, false doctrines. Heresies, those things that don't even are prescribed by God. Bring in false ideas like continual cleansing. Ideas that have nothing to do with God's word. They'll bring in destructive heresies. Even denying the Lord who brought them and bring on themselves what? Swift destruction. Sounds like the previous verse we read in Thessalonians. Where the Lord says, well, if you're going to do that, I'll just let you believe it. And many will follow their destructive ways. Who are the many? Well, if these false teachers are from within, that means many members within the Lord's church are going to follow these false ideas. Because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed, by covetousness they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time their judgment has not been idle, and their destruction does not slumber. Because of covetousness. They get something out of it. Talk about Olstein having jets and people just giving him money. And the people, you scratch your head, why would they do that? Don't they see through No, they don't see through it. They don't see through it because that's what the Lord says he's going to let them do. He's going to let them believe the strong delusions. He's going to let them believe the lies. He's going to let them believe the corrupt ideas that they're, they're passing on because they don't deserve heaven any more than anybody else does. And certainly not Olsen. Folks, this is scary information. Going to verse 9 through 15. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation and reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. Who's the ungodly we're talking about in this particular chapter? The false teachers. Whether they be in the church or out of the church. And especially those who walk according to the flesh and the lust of uncleanness and despise authority. They are what? Presumptuous and self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries, whereas the angels who are greater in power might do not bring a reviling accusation against them before the Lord. But these, like natural brute beasts, make made to be caught and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they do not understand. That makes sense, doesn't it? We start teaching false ideas, and then you start deceiving these ideas, and you not only are you deceiving others, but you start believing it yourself. They don't understand what they're saying. And will utterly perish in their own corruption. And will receive the wages of unrighteousness as those who count it pleasure to carouse or revel in the daytime. They are spots and blemishes carousing in their own deceptions while they feast with you. Having eyes full of adultery. And that cannot cease from sin. Enticing unstable souls. They... Have a heart trained in covetous practices and are accursed children. They have forsaken the right way and gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. How much could be said about this particular passage? Not only will the apostasy occur among the worldly people who have a form of godliness, but it will also enter the church in a form of false teachers. They will not handle God's word correctly. By deception and covetousness, they will fool many and bring destruction upon themselves. They lust after the flesh. They despise God's authority. If they respected God's authority, they would do what the Bible says to do. But they don't. They read passages, they twist them to make them mean something than what they say. They don't respect God's authority. They are presumptuous, they are self-willed, and they're not afraid to speak evil. Isn't that crazy? But yet, they're religious. They speak evil of the things that they don't know or they don't understand. They willingly are deceived and entice others to follow their evil ways. That kind of goes along with Romans one thirty-two. In fact, it says they revel. From the word carouse. In their own deception. It says with us. While indulging in adultery. Again the emphasis upon that they're within. These deceptive people. These deceptive false teachers. Are within the congregation. Within the church. While they're indulging in adultery. 
while they are deceiving people to believe lies, getting people to understand or to, to be misled and to be persuaded to not to follow God's word. As we've seen in our recent past, not to accept the Bible when it says don't drink. You see how it works? And then they themselves are already indulging in sin themselves, but yet they want others to indulge in it too. And so they'll teach people lies for the purpose of deceiving and being deceived. These are Christians that have forsaken the truth and gone astray. In fact, the verse says they can't cease from sin. They can't cease from sin. They like it so much, they continue. Again, these are false teachers within the Lord's church. They preach liberty, but in fact are slaves to corruption. Folks, Paul says turn away from these kind of folks. These are ungodly men. Let's go to Jude and read a little bit of what Jude had to say about these kind of folks. Jude verses 4 through 5. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, crept in, crept into the Lord's church, unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation. Ungodly men who turned the grace of God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. But I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt afterward, destroyed those who did not believe. They didn't get away with it, in other words. Folks, and the angels, who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he reserved an everlasting change under darkness, for the judgment of that great day. Folks, don't deceive yourself into thinking that you can possibly get away with this. Going to verse 10 and 11. But these speak evil of whatever they do not know. Again, same idea. They don't understand what they're saying. They don't understand. They do not know. And whatever they know naturally, like brute beast, in these things they crumb themselves. Like fleshly desire. He says, woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, have run greedily in the air of Balaam for profit, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. Three examples of how people think. And all along, they think that they're doing what is right. Balaam thought he was right. Cain thought he was right. Korah thought he was right. But all of them were wrong. Downright wrong. Going to verse 16 through 19. These are grumblers, complainers, walking according to their what? Their own lusts. And they mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. How they told you that there would be mockers in the last time. Who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. These are sensual persons. Who cause divisions. Not having the spirit. Hmm. Lo and behold. What ends up happening. These are ungodly people who cause divisions. Oftentimes churches are blindsided by such people. Why? Because they don't see it coming. We like to think that anybody who attends the church service with us is of the same mind, but they're not. There are many false people within the religious world, as we've already pointed out, but a lot of them are within the church itself. And they're deceiving, being deceived, following after their own ungodly lusts. And yet, they still have a means by which they can prey upon God's people. These men, as I'm both pointing, they, they go unnoticed in the church. I know a congregation, a liberal congregation split and it brings in a whole bunch of liberal members. They go unnoticed. After all, they were baptized in the Church of Christ. But what are they t saying? What are they teaching? What are they doing? What are they doing? They mock God and deny God, it says. They speak evil of people that they don't know. They grumble and complain while they speak big and follow their own lusts. They are carnally minded and they cause divisions within the church. 
Folks, we can't be blindsided by these kind of people. Or it's our souls that is in jeopardy as much as theirs. The latter end is worse than their beginning. Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2, and let's read verses 20 through 22. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. In other words, if you become a Christian and you understand what it was that you were supposed to be doing, but you get tangled back up in the world, become as wicked as perhaps you were before, maybe not quite as bad, but if you go back to those those practices, the end is going to be worse than, for you than the beginning. Otherwise, you're going to lose your soul. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But as it has happened to them, according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit, and a sow having washed, to wallowing in her mire. Folks, we need to be ready and on guard for such people because we live in these times that Paul has a very well described for us. As it has been prophesied, God will bring judgment on their wicked deeds. Verses 14 and 15 of Jude, Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, without spot and blame and blameless and consider that the long suffering of our lord is salvation as also our beloved brother paul according to the wisdom given to him has written to you folks we need to be ready and cautious i was reading the wrong passage because you all probably already know that verses 14 and 15 of jude now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men, also saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints, to what? To execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among all uh, among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. God's going to take care of this. He's going to punish the wicked for the evil things that they have done. And to this end, there are those who claim to know God, but they fail to obey him. And we point this out over and over again in Matthew chapter 7. This verse works so well in so many applications to the ungodly, to the religious that think that they're righteous. Going to verses 21 through 23, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonder work, wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You work without authority. You practice lawlessness. You don't pay attention to what the Bible does say. You don't adhere to it. You don't obey it. You pretend to, you make overtures to it, you, you, you claim that you are, you deceive others that you are, but he says they don't. He says only those who do God's will will go to heaven. Not those who pretend to do God's will. We live in these perilous times today. People who are pretending to be religious, who are doing everything other than what they're supposed to be doing, yeah, they make you feel good. But they're not teaching you the way of truth. They're not helping you along that narrow path. And so, just as an exhortation before we depart this morning, let's read out of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Verses 15 through 17. Therefore, brothers, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle. 
Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father, who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Folks, stand firm. Hang on to God's word. Test the spirits when they come about. Prove the things that are said. Prove the things that are written against God's written word. Stick with what is in the God's word. Don't go outside. Obey God's word because we live in a very wicked time. We've got to lean on the Lord. We've got to keep the words that Christ has given to us. And may our God comfort us and give us the strength as we live in these perilous times. We need to be sober about this. And we need to make sure that we are teaching the truth, not just paying lip service to it. If by chance you need our prayers, we'd be glad to say. Right along with you. Please come as we stand and sing the invitation song.